Herzlich willkommen zur 21. Außenpolitischen Jahrestagung der Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Um, for our international guests, to get started, please click at the globe at the bottom of your screen and select the English channel. Wir werden diese Veranstaltung wie letzte Woche in zwei Sprachen abhalten. Um, ich beginne erstmal in Deutsch, danach haben wir einen längeren englischen Block und wir enden noch mal kurz in Deutsch mit einer Verabschiedung. Die Veranstaltung wird aufgezeichnet. Das heißt, Sie können auch in ein paar Tagen diese Veranstaltung dann auch noch mal über YouTube äh, sich anschauen oder bei uns auf der Webseite. Und wie letzte Woche haben wir auch einen Chat, wo wir Sie mit Informationen versorgen werden zur Veranstaltung und wo Sie auch, so Sie ein Problem haben, sich gerne an unseren Tech Support wenden können, der dann Sie gerne unterstützt oder wenn Sie weiterführende Informationen gerne mit ähm, uns teilen möchten. Was erwartet Sie heute? Wir haben erstmal eine 30, wir werden erstmal 30 Minuten hier plenar, wie wir schön sagen, mit Ihnen zusammen verbringen und werden danach in, in sogenannte Breakout Sessions gehen. Um, das heißt, wir werden sie in vier Gruppen unterteilen und um, ich werde Ihnen dann gleich erklären, wie Sie in die entsprechende Gruppe kommen. Uh, nachdem Sie in 30 Minuten nochmal in Ihrer Gruppe waren, werden wir nochmal am Ende 30 Minuten alle zusammen verbringen. Das ist der Plan für heute. Es ist technisch etwas anspruchsvoll, aber ich denke, wir werden das alle hinkriegen. Und um, vielleicht fangen wir einfach damit an, dass wir Sie in Gruppen einteilen, dass Sie sehen, welche Gruppen es gibt. Und jetzt bitte ich meine Kolleginnen, eine entsprechende Folie einzublenden. Ich schaue mal, ob ich diese Folie sehe. Genau, Sie sehen in der Mitte eine Kachel, in dem Sie vier Themen sehen, nämlich, ich lese es mal in Englisch vor, Resilient Democracies. Transatlantic Security, den Green Deal und die Digital Sphere. Das sind vier Themen, die wir heute vertiefen wollen. Und Sie können sich jetzt überlegen, in, welches, in welche Gruppe möchte ich gerne mich 30 Minuten vertiefter unterhalten. Ähm, grundsätzlich funktioniert es so, damit wir Sie in die entsprechenden Gruppen reinkriegen, sollten Sie jetzt, äh, machen Sie Folgendes. Sie gehen mit der Maus auf Ihre Kachel, also auf das Bild, wo Sie sich sehen, machen, klicken rechts auf dieses Bild und kriegen dann die Option, Ihren Namen umzubenennen. Machen Sie einfach jetzt Folgendes vor Ihren Namen. Schreiben Sie 1, 2, 3 oder 4, je nachdem, in welche Gruppe Sie gehen wollen. Wenn Sie Corinna Fischer sehen oder Lena Strauß oder Polina Garaev, oder Senta Höfer, einige haben das schon gemacht. Und ansonsten haben Sie eine entsprechende Anleitung auch im Chat, wie Sie in diese Gruppen, wie Sie in diese Gruppen kommen können. Vielleicht noch zur Sprache eine Information. In der ersten Gruppe, Resilient Democracies, werden wir Deutsch und Englisch sprechen. Also da gibt es die simultane Übersetzung, während in den anderen Gruppen nur Englisch gesprochen wird. Keine Panik, falls Sie sich jetzt überfordert fühlen von diesen, ich muss meinen Namen umbenennen und eine, eine, eine Nummer machen. Ähm, es gibt zwei Optionen. Wenn Sie gar nichts machen, dann bleiben Sie einfach in diesem Raum und wir werden in 30 Minuten mit sehr interessanten Leuten das Thema Resilient Democracies mit Ihnen diskutieren. Wenn Sie ähm, ansonsten, wenn Ihnen das zu stressig ist, können Sie auch in den Chat Einfach eine Nummer reinschreiben. Sie möchten zu Green Deal gehen, schreiben Sie einfach drei rein und unser technischer Support wird dann versuchen, Sie entsprechend in diese Breakout-Session zu bringen. Jetzt fragen Sie sich vielleicht, warum Breakout-Sessions, was ist eigentlich heute los? Und deshalb würde ich gerne noch zwei, ähm, drei Worte zum Kontext dieser Veranstaltung sagen. Ähm, das ist die zweite Veranstaltung im Rahmen unserer außenpolitischen Jahrestagung. Um, unser großes Thema, das wir letzte Woche, diese Woche und nächste Woche ansprechen werden, ist 
die Europäische Union in der neuen Großmachtkonkurrenz. Ähm, und ich hatte letzte Woche schon gesagt, wir werden das Thema einmal europäisch, einmal transatlantisch und einmal grün angehen. Heute sind wir ähm, bei der sogenannten Transatlantik-Session angelangt und fragen uns Europa in der neuen Großmachtkonkurrenz, wie sieht es denn mit der wichtigsten Großmacht aus, nämlich den USA, wie sieht es mit uns und den Amerikanern aus. Äh, die letzten Jahre waren nicht einfach in transatlantischen Beziehungen, aber ähm, wir sehen auch durch die neue Amtsübernahme von Joe Biden sehr viel Hoffnung, dass Dinge besser werden können. Und was haben wir gemacht? Wir haben vorgestern 32 sehr interessante junge Transatlantikerinnen von beiden Seiten des Atlantiks zusammengebracht, 16 Amerikaner, 16 Europäerinnen und haben mit ihnen vertieft vier Themen diskutiert, die möglicherweise unsere transatlantische Agenda bereichern könnten, nämlich die Themen, die sie gesehen haben. Ähm, heute werden wir Ergebnisse dazu sehen und ähm, diese, und diese Ergebnisse wollen wir dann auch mit Ihnen diskutieren, ver, ver, vertieft eben, wie gesagt, in diesen kleineren äh, Breakout-Gruppen. Jetzt habe ich Sie schon technisch ein bisschen gestresst mit diesen Umbenennen. Jetzt geht es gleich nochmal weiter mit ein bisschen Technikstress, denn wir würden gerne, wie letzte Woche, mit Ihnen kurz ins Gespräch kommen und äh, eine sogenannte Menti-Umfrage machen. Das heißt, wir würden gerne jetzt von Ihnen erstmal so eine Einschätzung oder ein Gefühl kriegen, wie Sie die transatlantische Agenda sehen. Und dazu bitten wir Sie, ein Smartphone, so Sie eines zur Hand haben, zu nehmen. Und Sie haben jetzt zwei Möglichkeiten. Sie können entweder diesen QR-Code, diesen QR-Code, den Sie sehen, einscannen und sollten dann direkt zu einer Umfrage kommen. Wenn Sie nicht äh, scannen können, können Sie auch einfach in Ihrem Smartphone oder auch auf Ihrem Laptop äh, auf, auf dem Browser einfach menti.com eingeben und dann den Code 9387695. Wenn Sie ähm, das gemacht haben, sollte auf Ihrem Smartphone oder auf Ihrem Endgerät, das Sie haben, äh, die erste Frage erscheinen und ähm, ich denke, wir lassen uns noch mal kurz Zeit, dass Sie sich das ähm, vielleicht, ähm, dass Sie die Umfrage starten können, aber so wie mein Team bereit ist, hier Antworten einzublenden, könnten wir auch schon eine erste Antwort uns anschauen. Die erste Frage, die uns natürlich interessiert, ist nach vier Jahren Trump. Wie stark Sie die transatlantischen Beziehungen heute einschätzen? Links überhaupt nicht stark, rechts sehr stark. Und wir sehen hier ähm, schon die erste Tendenz, die ja, darauf hinweist, dass es, sagen wir mal, ähm, eher so, so, so ein Mittelwert ist, der aber leicht negativ ist, also nicht allzu stark. Das Ganze passt ganz gut zu einer Umfrage, die wir letzte Woche mal im Bereich Sicherheitspolitik gemacht haben, wo wir gefragt haben, wer, wer ist eigentlich Deutschlands wichtigster Partner in der Sicherheitspolitik? Und die überwiegende Mehrheit hat sich für Frankreich entschieden und ein sehr viel kleinerer Teil für die USA. Das heißt, auch hier sehen wir den Trend, dass die transatlantische Partnerschaft zumindest von unserem Publikum als mäßig stark ausbaufähig angesehen wird. Vielleicht ändert sich ja das nach unserem Workshop, wo wir neue Ideen für die transatlantische Agenda vorstellen möchten. Dann würde ich mir jetzt gerne die zweite Frage anschauen, die Sie möglicherweise schon beantwortet haben. Denn diese Frage führt uns auch ein bisschen dahin ähm, zu, zu unserem Thema. Nämlich, wir haben der, der alte Transatlantizismus war sehr stark sicherheitspolitisch ähm, getrieben und, und hatte eine sehr starke NATO-Komponente. 
Aber wir wollen ja heute Ideen in die Debatte bringen, dass wir zwischen Europa und Amerika mehr als nur Sicherheit haben. Und haben Sie deshalb gefragt, was ist Ihrer Meinung nach das entscheidende Thema in den transatlantischen Beziehungen im nächsten Jahr? Und natürlich sehen wir als Grüne Stiftung sehr gerne, dass Klima ganz vorne ist, aber es ist ein Kopf-an-Kopf-Rennen mit äh, demokratischen Werten. Ja, jetzt sind sie äh, gleich auf. Also die Tendenz ist klar, der alte Transatlantizismus, der sicherheitspolitisch, äh, ähm, einen sicherheitspolitischen Fokus hatte, ist vielleicht heute nicht mehr so gefragt, zumindest in unserem Milieu. Und wir suchen oder wir sehen Synergien im Bereich Klima und demokratische Werte, Verteidigung der Demokratie, die wir, mit denen wir auf beiden Seiten des Atlantiks gut zusammenarbeiten können. Und ähm, jetzt, denke ich, können wir uns anschauen, was unsere Expertinnen, die wir eben vorgestern zusammengebracht haben, in den letzten Tagen erarbeitet haben. Und dafür übergebe ich die Moderation erstmal an David Patrician, der ein ähm, amerikanischer Journalist in Hamburg ist und ähm, gestern auch mit einer Gruppe über den Green Deal ähm, ähm, moderiert hat und gearbeitet hat und jetzt quasi die, die Moderation übernimmt. Wir machen ab jetzt weiter in Englisch. David, ich hoffe, du, hast den, du bist zweisprachig. Ich hoffe, du hast den englischen Kanal schon eingeschaltet. Und, schon, ja, ja. Ja, und wir, wir, wir bitten eben... Äh, Nee, jetzt, jetzt geht es einfach in Englisch weiter und, und wir, wie gesagt, wir haben ja den, die Möglichkeit der Simultanübersetzung. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Giorgio. Yeah, very interesting to see the results of the Menti. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to thank Giorgio for this introduction and also take a moment to thank the Heinrich Bull Stiftung, the foundation, for their help in putting this event together. Uh, we have people from around the world today joining us, so I will start off by saying good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. And I hope that everyone is doing okay and is healthy in these very, very trying times with the coronavirus. Um, if I look a little tired, that is actually true. I actually stayed up uh, until about four in the morning watching the inauguration of Joe Biden and also the first press conference, which was fantastic actually to see questions being asked and relatively truthful answers being answered. Um, it is a very exciting time. Um, within the first 24 hours, the United States came back to the Paris Climate Agreement, as well as uh, pledging to support its uh, relief for the World Health Organization. And as we all know, later this year, Germany will also hold its elections. So uh, it truly is a very, I think, exciting time for the transatlantic relationship. And that makes our event here even more relevant. As Giorgio mentioned, it was a pleasure to meet some of our participants on Tuesday. And uh, we went through and we had four groups. I think you can see it on the screen, but I will again repeat what those four groups are because we're going to start our presentations in a moment. The first one was resilient democracies. The second one, the transatlantic security. The third one, the Green Deal, of course, dealing with the environment. And the fourth one, digital sphere. And what we plan on doing now is that we will have each group come and give a virtual presentation. I think you all received the email before, but I just wanted to double check. So we have a time limit of from three minutes to a maximum of five minutes. There I will be very German, when ich darf so sagen, I have my watch <laughs> here, and I will put the timer on, but do be relaxed. The one thing I will tell my group though, is that the groups that if you do reach the five minute mark and you're still presenting, I will interrupt you. Please don't be upset about that. That's just to make sure everyone has the same amount of time. And I will kindly say, please finish your last sentence so that we can continue. So without further ado, and uh, please, when I have each group come to our digital stage, I will simply ask, are you ready? Can we hear you? Is everything good? And once we're all set with that, I will say the time begins now and you may begin. So don't worry about any time being taken away as we get arranged. So without further ado, with our first group, which is Resilient Democracies, I would like to invite, I believe it's Daniel, to our digital stage. And I'll wait until I can see Daniel. Yes, and we also have these wonderful graphic designs. Um, already I can say a big thank you to the two graphic designers who really tried to put and animate some of our discussions onto paper. We have the first graphic up, thank you. And Daniel, can you hear or see me? 
Maybe if you have your yes, mic. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Because I think I couldn't unmute myself just a second ago. I see you and I hear you. Fantastic. Wonderful. Perfect. Good. I have my clock here. Daniel, are you ready to begin your presentation for the results of democracies? Yes? Let's start this. You may begin, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So um, thank you for the introduction. I'm, I have the honor right now to present all the outcomes of our um, conversations on resilient democracies. And maybe just to begin, the leading questions or question for our group was, how can we join forces and make our democracies more resilient against disinformation, election intrusion from external and from internal forces? And actually, we started out with a bit of a philosophical question, which was, has democracy actually ever been resilient or more resilient than nowadays? And should we not maybe strive for something new or for something that we haven't yet become rather than trying to revert to some old, and, uh, some old or golden days? And one of the most important things we talked about, I think, at the baseline are a common understanding of democracy. And one of the participants said that um, democracy is a participatory sport and not a spectator one. And I believe that that's a threat that really is um, all along these conversations. And um, first and foremost, we believe that there has to be a common and shared set of democratic values, such as, for instance, freedom of speech, which is, of course, differently interpreted, say, in the, in the US or in Europe, especially when we look at the First Amendment in the United States, which covers, for example, many parts of hate speech, whereas in Germany, on the other extreme, Holocaust denial, for instance, is illegal. And once we have a certain set of democratic values and understanding of these values, it will need to be very important and crucial to also communicate and translate them into individual empowerment for people of all strata of society. And to give these people a sense of participation and to also thus sustainably counteract potential for radicalization, for instance. Another important point we discussed was digital competency. So this means enabling people to navigate through the information space, no matter what kind of technology will be put up in two or 20 years from now and potentially unfortunately used by malicious actors against us. And this will also of course include critical learning of not just conscious or unconscious, but also conscious biases, which disinformation, propaganda or radicalization often exploits within society. And it will be important as well, of course, to not only teach about digital competency, but also about different ways that citizens can actually interact with governments and how they can actually participate in a democracy at this day and age, rather than just joining a party, for instance. Another innovative idea I believe that we discussed was public funding, not just of media, which is already a trend in uh, Western Europe, but also of civil society. So pretty much that would possibly empower civil society rather than putting them in some artificial competition for the same resources, even though many of, of these organizations actually have the same larger goal of, of strengthening resilient uh, democracies. And then this is something that touches upon the digital sphere as well, so I'll keep this very short, as platform regulation, which we believe is one of the key areas with which we can actually support resilient democracies. Of course, it needs to be smart regulation. And we believe that, um, for example, things such as the DSA and DMA on a European level should be a global approach and cooperated with, uh, with the United States. And maybe to come to a conclusion, just a few other thoughts that I believe were very interesting. First of all, we think that um, we need to rethink disinformation as a threat coming just from Russia or China, but also from other state and non-state actors. And that maybe this false dichotomy between external and internal threats is not really up to date anymore. And that we should rather focus on the solution, meaning furthering or strengthening resilient democracies, rather than just looking at the source of these threats that are ever changing. And an interesting thought as well was um, more of a focus on campaign financing and corporate support for candidates and for advertisement online. So this speaks a lot about transparency and about that value for a resilient democracy at this day and age. And in the end, um, to top it all off, so to speak, we believe that anything that we would do in support of resilient democracies will always be centered around rebuilding trust of the population, of citizens in their own uh, participation in democratic institutions and democracy as such. So this will always be at the source of all of these efforts. And I hope that I have met uh, the time. <laughs> you have, absolutely, four minutes 20. I'll give you, first of all, an applause. If you're at home, feel free to applause. I know it's not the same as being in a live group together. You can do a digital applause or an actual applause. Thank you very much. Fantastic presentation, Daniel. 
And that gives you just basically a, a, a view of what kind of interesting discussions and talent we had for this group uh, last Tuesday coming in together for this Thursday. Daniel, thank you very much. And I think we're going to move on now to our second group. The time was fine, under five minutes. Uh, next up, we should be having the group Transatlantic Security. And our speaker there will be Julia, or Julia, I guess, in Germany. Uh, Julia, can you hear me? Are you there? And you can already see the wonderful graphics coming up. This is our second group, Transatlantic Security. And we are waiting for Julia. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and I can see you too. Wonderful. How are you? Everything good? Great. Thank you, David. Fantastic. Good. So without further ado, let me just make sure my clock is turned on here. And are you ready to begin with your presentation? Absolutely. You may now begin. Group number two, Transatlantic Security. Please go ahead. So first of all, hello to everyone and thanks for the nice introduction. It's a very great pleasure for me to present and the thought of the Transatlantic Security Group on the timely question of what would be a promising division of labor between NATO allies on both sides of the Atlantic. In our group of eight next generation experts from Europe and North America, we had a very fascinating debate about some of the issues we found most challenging about the topics we believe should be priorities for NATO and of course how burden sharing between North American and European allies could look like. First of all, our group agreed that we need a moment of healing in transatlantic relations, which I think everyone can just subscribe to. We identified there, that there are two possible ways of speaking about an effective division of labor. The one is alongside geographical lines, the other one is along thematic lines. Now, when we look at the geographical lines, it becomes clear that European allies are immediately affected by what is happening in their neighborhood, including southern and eastern periphery. Potential conflicts or even crises evolving there can possibly have destabilizing effects on the security and territorial integrity of all European allies. It is therefore in the interest of European allies um, to step up their engagement, including through developing their own military capabilities and to create greater unity among member states if an emerging situation represents a threat and requires territorial defense and crisis management. At the same time, by stepping up their engagement in the neighborhood, European allies would make it easier for the US to focus on the Indo-Pacific region, which has been a greater priority for Washington, and that might be the case with the new Biden administration as well. Now, when we look at the thematic field and the broader picture there, it becomes clear that when speaking about a better, more effective division of labor, we probably need a more suitable and valid definition of security today, which necessarily includes cyber threats, hybrid threats, climate security, resilient democracies, and protection of critical infrastructure. And of course, we need a better understanding of where Europeans might have a more added value today and where the EU and civilian tools can play a greater role. This also points to another important point, and that is that NATO and the EU have to significantly intensify their cooperation, which is usually referred to as strengthening, strengthening the European pillar within NATO. Speaking of fields in which European allies can bring added value, we also discussed quickly that in the sphere of intelligence sharing, for example, European NATO members clearly come with a strong resources and in this regard, a stronger mapping of intelligence capability in NATO makes sense. Within this wider field, NATO is already acknowledging most of these emerging threats. However, our group highlighted the need for NATO and that includes allies from both sides of the Atlantic to put a stronger emphasis on climate security, health security and resilience of democracies. And although these are no, no traditional fields in which NATO can become active, democratic resilience is a good example of an area that recently gained more attention in the NATO discourse and was also mentioned in a recently published NATO 2030 report. Um, finally, I'd like to say that you certainly noticed that we haven't con concentrated that much on the obvious question of the def defense investment pledge and the 2 and 20 percent goals. We had a brief conversation about it, of course, but decided um, not to focus too much um, on, on replicating this all too obvious elephant in the room debate, but on other more practical steps. And with that, I thank you for your attention and hand back over to David. Thank you very much. I'd like to also give you an applause. Thank you, Julia. Fantastic. Very, very important and a very interesting presentation. Good. Then the time is good. I'll stop my clock and we're ready then for our third group. The third group is the Green Deal. 
and the Greendale actually had a chance to facilitate and watch a little bit of their discussion on Tuesday. It was actually very interesting. And as we all know, it's not only a transatlantic um, issue, it is a global and international issue. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to ask the group representative there, that would be Maria. If she is there, Maria, can you hear and see me? And Sorry, David, which Maria? There are many oh. Marias in here. I apologize. I am Purdue mit alle die Leute. Um, could maybe someone tell me what's the last name of my Maria? Or if you're there, Maria, if you could write it in our chat box, because I just know the first name oh, myself. No. Sorry, my, I couldn't switch on my mic. Yeah, I can hear and see you, David, perfectly. Oh, okay. And Maria, what's your last name? Pastakova is my last name. With a T, correct? Yes. So Maria T would be the answer there. Maria T. I um, yeah, is, is your, my, your microphone is on and is, is also your screen, your camera is also on? Yes, everything on, everything ready. Okay. For this one, I don't see you on my screen, but if everyone's good, I don't see any problems with the technical gurus here. We have two of them there. So I think we'll begin then. Our third group, the Green Deal, you can see already the wonderful graphics we have up there. Maria, are you ready to begin your five minute presentation or maximum five minute presentation right now? Yes, I am, David. Wonderful. Then the time will begin now. Thank you. So the question we addressed in our group was how to strengthen our cooperation and creative, uh, create positive synergies between the European and uh, the American Green Deal. Uh, what I will present is only a glimpse of what we discussed the day before yesterday, and we're glad to discuss these issues in the breakout room further. Uh, but for now, there are three essential aspects I would like to sketch out. First of all, uh, though climate and green economic growth are high on Joe Biden's policy agenda, it is still not clear how much of, of it he will be able to implement in actual policies. As it is, the president will not have the needed majority in the Senate to pass legislation that brings ch uh, changes to federal spending, revenue, and the debt limit. Uh, according to the Senate's filibuster rules, it would require at least 60 senator votes, uh, while there are only 50 Democrats who made it to the Senate uh, this time. So there are other mechanisms the Democratic administration could use, for example, the budget reconciliation process, but it is not clear how much will they be able to achieve this way. As, uh, though there is much uh, uh, not clear yet, there, uh, the U.S. still doesn't have a Green Deal, but there are still at least several fields of for fruitful cooperation on energy and climate between the EU and the US, which is my second point. First of all, uh, both parties don't have to start from zero. Uh, there were several mechanisms the US and the EU cooperated on during Obama's presidency, such as the Green Climate Fund, and it would make sense to resume this work by the present administration. Also, Green Deal has not completely disappeared from the agenda during Trump's administration. As we have seen, it was maintained by the U.S. cities and states that pursued commitments to Paris targets and maintained cooperation with the EU on subnational level within the C40 Global Covenant and within the other institutions. So it would be a good place to start. There are furthermore several potential fields for cooperation, um, one of them being research and development of hydrogen and low carbon technologies. Hydrogen here is particularly interesting given that the, EU, uh, the US is a major exporter of, of liquefied natural gas, LNG, and they will want to develop cost efficient ways to decarbonize this fuel given that the energy transition agenda um, is the core of uh, one of its potential export markets, the in European Union. One further field um, for cooperation could be norms and standards setting on climate and sustainable energy, as well as on low carbon and power generation and transmission technologies. This is particularly important in view of the growing presence of other powers, first of all, China in international and regional, regional standard setting institutions. Also, cooperation on strengthening multilateral institutions in which the US presence has been weakened in the recent years, including the WTO and the IMF is one central field, uh, uh, particularly particularly in view of the need for the green recovery after the corona crisis. Finally, a sustainable energy transition and climate policies require also major behavioral change by the consumers. In this context, ramping up uh, communication efforts in the EU and in the US, but also globally, uh, to bring the Green Deal forward uh, could be a fruitful field for cooperation. Uh, trade is a third and last major issue I'd like to mention. Given that the EU intends to introduce carbon border adjustments within its own Green Deal agenda, which might become a stumbling block on the way to trade cooperation between the US and the EU, since uh, the US is unlikely um, to introduce carbon pricing at the federal level, at least in the midterm. 
it is therefore important for both countries or for both sides to achieve some kind of the green truth and find some kind of compromise on these issues. We also discuss many other things uh, and many other um, disturbing issues, such as, for example, what will become of North, on the Nord Stream 2 and how will it affect the energy and climate relations between the two parties. Um, but I think I run out of time very uh, shortly, so I'm glad and we are glad to discuss all these issues in the breakout room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great job, Maria. And I would like to just add one note. I recently read an article, it's very interesting, um, through the coronavirus, which of course is a very serious issue and a problem, there may be one silver lining, and that is when it comes to the environment, uh, researchers will be able to take a look and see how one year was with very limited air travel, car travel, and a reduction in many of the pollutions. So maybe that can be used as a template. So maybe that is one of the few silver linings that we have from this corona pandemic. Thank you very much. And it was also a pleasure to listen and participate in your discussion on Tuesday. Good, then let me stop my clock here. We're doing great with the times. I appreciate everyone keeping the time. It is time now for our fourth group and that would be Digital Sphere. And there we are going to have Sabina. And we have the graphic already there, fantastic. I'd like to ask Sabina, are you there? Can you hear and can you see me? I'm here, David, hello. Uh, I can hear and see you and I hope everybody yes, else can see I can hear and see you as well, wonderful. Perfect. So we're very excited. Let me get my clock here ready. Sabina, are you ready to present uh, your summary for the Digital Sphere Group? Yes, I'm ready. And I had the honor to be in a group with um, very great people who've worked on both digital policy and on China and uh, on transatlantic digital policy in China. So that was a very good discussion that we had. Your time, let me just jump in just so I have protocol. Your time will begin now. Go ahead. Okay. So um, we were discussing uh, a EU-US approach to China in the global digital sphere. And um, we want to start or want to start summing up why we recommend to shift the framing actually from countering China to crafting a global digital agenda, a global democratic digital agenda. That's our main outcome. Um, we recognize that the US and the EU come from very different places on China and on digital policy. For the US, there's always a stronger focus on national security. For the EU, there's a stronger focus on human rights. Both are in competition with China, but they're also economic competitors. So we have different approaches on both sides of the Atlantic to digital policy, as we all know, from digital taxation to transatlantic data flows. We hope to resolve some of them soon, but that's by no means easy. And the EU is, has made it clear that it's keen on developing its own European vision for the future of technology and doesn't want to be forced to choose between China and the US. But we do observe also some transatlantic convergence more recently, both on China and on digital policy. European countries have a greater awareness of the security risks of Chinese technology, referring to the Huawei debate, obviously. And in the US, there's greater awareness of the need to regulate the platform economy. Um, you heard that actually in President Biden's inaugural address um, um, that we have to uh, defeat the lies and um, uh, defend the truth, um, and that refers to the platforms. Um, there's less resistance against platform regulation in the US now. In fact, there's great interest in the Digital Services Act proposal by the European Commission. You can actually also read Tyson Barker's article in Foreign Policy about that. He's in our group. On China, we can identify some common instruments and bilateral projects for us to address national security, competitiveness, and human rights, such as common standards on investment screening and supply chain security, research cooperation or standards for emerging technologies. Also, we can talk about export controls for surveillance technology, for example, in the human rights area. And, but we think that the most effective way to do these things would be in concert with other like-minded partners with other democracies. And you can also check out what Marta and Rebecca have been working on in drafting a proposal for a multilateral technology alliance. And you can all put that in the chat, by the way, if you want to share those links. We think that all such debates have to be charged. And that's where we go to the Democrat, Democrat Credit resilience group with shared values, sustainability, inclusion, democracy, human rights. Those are our shared values. And we also think that we can overcome some of our differences by focusing on the structures rather than the content of our approaches to digital governance. So transparency, accountability, or legal redress for citizens should always be at the heart of such structures when it comes to democratic legitimacy. 
And last but not least, if I have this to say this, um, if I have time to say this, we also think that the leading democracies and the leading technology nations do have a responsibility to provide digital public goods to the parts of the world that increasingly depend on Chinese technology. Developing and emerging economies should be part of the discussions over what an innovative, inclusive, democratic and rights-based and sustainable digital space should look like. Thanks a lot. And with that, I'll hand it back to David. Thank you very much, Sabina. Appreciate it. And yeah, no question about it. Digitalization is changing at such a very, very rapid pace. It is a challenge for governments to really keep up with the change and to put the regulation into place with that. So thank you very much, Sabina. Good. I wanted to take a moment then, first of all, to A, thank all of our four groups and the presentations and the presenters. They were really fantastic. In addition, we had the graphics, which were really a great support. Um, again, I have only the first names, but it's Flores and Bettina. I wanted to also say a thank you to the wonderful graphics in such a short amount of time. Um, a great support in trying to get the message across for our presentations. And what, of course, what's very important for our, our dialogue and our conference today is that we have an interactive platform, which brings me to the next part of our conference. Now, bear with me. I've done many Zoom meetings with 50 people, with 80 people, but as I look at our counter here, we're above 200 people. And the great excitement about or adventure with Zoom is that as much as you try, technically there's always gonna be some challenge. So let's just give it our best shot. But this is how things are ideally supposed to work. And Philip, my technical guru for today, if I say anything wrong on a technical note, feel free to jump in with your voice or camera and say, David, that's not right, because I'd rather hear it from you than have a mistake. But the way we've said it is that as Giorgio mentioned before, you've had a chance now to pre-select the groups that you'd like to be moved into. The first one being one, resilient democracies, two, transatlantic security, three, the green deal, and four, digital sphere. Once we go ahead and give the, the breakaway, automatically you should be moved into those rooms. You do not have to click anything. Again, I repeat, you should automatically be moved into those rooms. If for whatever reason you are not, you will stay in the main room, or if somehow you get pushed out of the meeting completely, you know, I'm very sorry about that, but you can certainly click back on the Zoom link and join us as quickly as possible. The schedule says 18 minutes. Let me be a little bit casual and say 20 minutes. Please forgive me, Jojo, for the extra two minutes time. I'd like to give everyone 20 minutes then to go ahead and go into those groups. There will be discussions and the, and the presenters that we had will be part of the teams that we'll be discussing. Feel free to go ahead and write questions in the chat box. If I'm not mistaken, when you go into the great room, excuse me, the break rooms, your microphones will be turned off. If they're not, please make sure they're muted unless you'd like to talk. And after that, we will come back after 20 minutes and continue with our program. So if that's okay, let me just see if I can hear Philip. Philip, does that sound right to you as my technical guru? Yeah, maybe you need to accept the invitation to the breakout session. Ah, okay, that sounds good. But before I do that, there's one more important thing because I saw Corinna's eyebrows rise and that tells, I can see what she's thinking. Very important with the languages, I just wanted to remind you that we have one group that will be in German and in English, that's the resilient democracies, and the other three will be just in English. That's transatlantic security, green deal, and digital sphere. So I just wanted to make sure you remember that. So is that, have a good trip. I see some of you have already left the room and we'll see you in 20 minutes. Bye-bye. Thank Let's you, David. Um, I will take on from here into the main room. Um, I hope you can all understand me. If you're not hearing me, this could be because of your language setting. Uh, so you can go ahead and uh, change your channel on which you're speaking uh, and hearing. So whatever language you prefer, um, please select this. And if you're speaking, please select the language you're speaking in. Otherwise, our translators will uh, not be happy. And David is still here. Uh, you should also uh, move yes, into I a breakout room. A message. Somehow on my Zoom, even though I update it, I'm not quite sure. I don't see the message to move to the room. So okay. as soon as I get the technical go, I will run to the green room. I promise. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, for all of you who are not in the breakout that uh, you would like to join, please write to the chat support. Milena, my colleague, um, 
and we will have that ready for you. Otherwise, uh, you're in and uh, stuck with uh, me and the group uh, on resilient democracy. Uh, you already heard Daniel presenting our results um, and I see some last minute changes. Um, this is all possible <laughs> in Zoom and it only takes a second. So uh, if you want to move, this is your moment. Perfect. So um, I thought the presentation was really interesting and I saw some some questions popping up already. Um, if you have a question, uh, please write it in the chat. Maybe after all the people uh, who wanted to change their rooms um, have left our meeting. So if you have a question to the group uh, or something that you think is also important, uh, please um, let us know in the chat. Otherwise, uh, I would start with a little um, thing that I um, actually was uh, reading in the Washington uh, Post yesterday. They said that uh, the disinformation campaign actually went down 73%. So disinformation about uh, the election went down 73% in a couple of days. Uh, when um, Trump was banned on Twitter. So uh, I thought that was a really good point um, uh, for the uh, platform regulations that uh, Daniel mentioned. Um, dear group, do you want to add anything um, to dive deeper into our questions or do you have any comments right now uh, that we want to or that you want to share to, to start off our, our little discussion? Um, since I presented before, maybe it's uh, easier if I make the first <laughs> move. Um, I thought it was really interesting, Corinna, what you just said. Um, but I think what's probably important to state as well is that um, number you were talking about probably also means the disinformation that we can see. So platforms we're more familiar with, such as Facebook and Twitter, and probably most likely Twitter, because it's one of the only platforms that actually has more of an open API and more access to researchers. So I'm just wondering whether that number also holds true for more niche networks, such as Parler or um, a Grab or Discord or anything like that. So I feel like that will probably be one of the challenges going forward to also not just um, look at the platforms that give us their API or at the big platforms, but also what's going on in the niches uh, really of, of the internet, right, really. And also to define what disinformation really is. Is it really about being wrong or false and correct? Or is there maybe more to it and how do we measure that? Yeah, just maybe as a direct response to what you just said. Okay, yeah, uh, I would very much agree. I uh, see we don't have the, the uh, audience engaged right now. So uh, I would start uh, us off with a little uh, priority. Um, so bear with me real quick. Um, you all know our tool Menti. Uh, so I would just share this quick um, quick survey with you. Uh, so this code is a new one. Please go to Menti again and use the following code. I think you're all experts by now. Um, and I have a small question for you. Um, you saw the different um, yeah, the different topics that uh, the group discussed on Tuesday, um, and they were really unsure uh, where to lay our priorities. Um, so my question to you all would be, uh, what should be the given priority to, um, I think the three um, most important, um, yeah, the three more, okay. See the first, um, the first answers coming in. Uh, right now, on the first place, more funding for civil society. So um, not just for the media, but to organizations. That's quite interesting. Okay. So maybe that solves the discussion that uh, went on uh, in, our, in our working group on Tuesday. 
Uh, what do you think, Daniel? Uh, is this something you would agree with or any other of the group members? Um, you can just raise your hand as well if you want to say anything. Um, would you agree with this priority? So should we uh, prioritize um, funding for civil society before everything else? Okay, Chris Fowler, thank you. I will um, give you the floor. Uh, you have a, um, are you agreeing or disagreeing with uh, this little, I would say, focus group? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th thanks for the invitation, uh, Karina. And, uh, and yes, just to, uh, uh, yeah, I, I do agree with this prioritization. It, it, it aligns with, with my thoughts as well. Um, I think regulation is, uh, is, is important, um, but uh, if people will always trust information that they find uh, from communities and organizations and people that they trust. And if we can uh, reinforce civil society by, by funding those things better, helping people find community, um, uh, the, uh, that will uh, help inform the second bar, uh, bit, which is uh, to, to, to support media education and, um, and, and how to discern uh, messages that, that come from media. Um, you know, much has been made over the past uh, months here in the United States with all of the focus on STEM education for all well and good reasons. Uh, not so much attention has been paid towards uh, making discernments uh, between uh, uh, the validity and, uh, and, and truthfulness, let's say, of, of messages that we get in media. So. Um, you know, you invest in civil society, create communities uh, that, that are high, high value and uh, high on information and, uh, and then uh, support media education. And then as a last resort, uh, regulations, I, I think uh, is what makes sense for me. Perfect. Thank you for starting us off. Uh, I now see a lot of raised hands and I would give the floor to uh, Sergei Lagudinsky, who is also um, one of our speakers later on, so an expert that will um, give us his opinion anyways later on. But uh, as you have already raised your hand, uh, I'm curious of yeah, what you I have to answer. I should, yeah, yeah, I understand, then I should be brief. Uh, just very briefly, uh, just financing uh, civil society is a good thing, but don't forget that civil society is a very diverse thing. So the question is, what kind of civil society you want to finance? Can you discriminate? Uh, there are right-wing NGOs, there are fascist NGOs. Uh, so I just want to alert you uh, to uh, um, to the questions that are associated with that, and maybe you have ideas on how to deal with that. Yeah, I, that's a question I think we can give uh, directly also to the group. I don't know, Marian, uh, who also was in our uh, group on Tuesday on the working group, uh, might already have an answer. So Marian, uh, I give the floor to you, uh, whether you have to add anything to the presentation or already have an answer to what kind of civil society groups uh, we should uh, be focused on. Um, I agree with that point entirely, but I'm less concerned about it because actually the networking among civil society organizations and between civil society and funders and governments is very strong. So everyone kind of knows everyone in the field. There's a lot of newly emerging initiatives. Those are also very often fostered by all kinds of foundations. So it's not like you're going to accidentally, um, without knowing it, fund an extreme right organization um, that much, I think. But the main point I wanted to make that I've also made in the chat is it's not just a point of better fun of more funding, but of better funding, because one of and I'm speaking as a civil society organization currently writing funding proposals. One of the main issues is there's in Europe almost no funding available for core functions or core infrastructure. It's all projects funding that cannot be used for other things. And sometimes you see horrendous cash flow arrangements that just make it very difficult for us to survive. And, and just a tweak there without even adding additional funding would make a huge difference. And to give you an example, we are running a project at the moment to try and insert some democratic elements, some democratic backbone to the climate action. So to make sure that you don't lose people in the process, that you don't have an increase of populism because of the way you push through climate measures. 
And we as a small NGO are expected to upfront pay our expenses and our staff for 18 months prior to being paid by European funding. And this is impossible. This is, this is not something we can do. So it sounds like a boring administrative thing, but if there was more awareness of the way civil society organizations actually work, I think we could do so much more with, with the money that's available. Thank you for this uh, real life experience. I know that you're uh, talking um, yeah, from experience and I would give uh, the floor now to Jörg. Um, I can't uh, read your whole last name. That's why I will stick to the first name basis. Um, Jörg, uh, you can. Yeah, vielen Dank. Um, uh, ich bin so ein bisschen außerhalb der Geschichte, weil ich vom japanisch-deutschen Zentrum komme, aber uh, das Thema Zivilgesellschaft liegt mir sehr am Herzen. Ich bin auch Mitglied im Förderkreis vom Kampakt, also weiß so ein bisschen, wovon ich rede, wenn es ums Geld geht. Ich finde generell ähm, Stärkung ähm, der Zivilgesellschaft ist das Thema und das ist nicht nur ein finanzieller Aspekt, wie wir gehört haben, sondern auch eine Frage von Infrastruktur und die ist nicht nur monetär ausgerichtet. Und ich glaube, das ist ein entscheidender Faktor, wie sich in Zukunft ähm, das transatlantische Verhältnis entwickelt, weil ich die These mal vertrete, es gibt auch einen Trumpismus ohne Trump. Ja, also wenn wir wissen, wie viele Leute Trump gewählt haben, die sind ja nicht weg. Und wir sollen uns nicht erheben als Europäer, die so vieles besser machen, denn äh, die illiberale Demokratie ist ja auch in Europa auf dem Vormarsch. Das heißt, da sind ja riesige Herausforderungen. Und das Einzige, was ich sehe, was dem entgegenarbeitet, ist tatsächlich die Stärkung der Zivilgesellschaft. So viel wie möglich. Also wir sind alles Demokraten, ja, aber den Mund aufmachen. Wenn ich das mal sehe in meinem Betrieb, ja, da gibt es auch solche Auffassungen, den Mund aufzumachen und sagen, stopp, also hier wird eine rote Linie überschritten und äh, also Demokrat äh, zu sein heißt nicht nur de sich als Demokrat fühlen, sondern auch als Demokrat sprechen und handeln, wo immer es geht. Weil wenn man schweigt, stimmt man zu. Und deswegen mein Plädoyer, ähm, es hat auch was mit der eigenen Haltung zu tun, aber natürlich hat es vor allem auch zu tun, die Zivilgesellschaft zu stärken und da kann jeder einen Beitrag leisten. Mikro, 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 Mikro. Corinna, Corinna Mikrofon. Um, sorry, this uh, didn't work. Uh, so thank you, uh, Jörg, for your contribution. Um, this was my first um, experience with um, uh, language channels. So uh, I hope uh, all of you can, could also enjoy this. And uh, Tori, uh, one of our other experts that will um, talk later on as well uh, in our discussion, in our closing discussion, also has a comment here. So Tori from the Brookings Institute, um, please let us know uh, what you're thinking to this. Well, thank you very much, Karina. And I've, I've found this conversation fascinating, um, particularly the democratic resilience conversation, which is why I chose this breakout session. And, um, you know, the comments I have to make now are not formal, but I'm just kind of musing and reacting to what is being said. And I thought what was interesting in the earlier remarks made about your takeaways um, is that we have to move beyond this false dichotomy of focusing on external threats um, via disinformation and election intrusion versus internal threats. Um, and I was thinking about this yesterday, watching the inauguration, like many of you did, and listening to the oath that President, now President Biden made, in which he said, I you know, solemnly swear to defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I was thinking about how my understanding of that would have changed throughout the years. So perhaps if I was an American in 1982, I was thinking about the Soviet Union as a, as a foreign threat to the, to the very constitution of the United States. Um, in 2003, perhaps even 2008, I was thinking about um, the threat of Islamic terrorism and Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Um, And yesterday, as he gave this oath, I was picturing insurrectionists scaling the walls of the US Capitol building. 
And I couldn't believe that that's how I now view uh, enemies to, to the United States, to our very constitution and to our way of life. And so, again, that's all to say, I completely agree that we have to move beyond this dichotomy of looking at threats to our constitutions, to our democracies um, as external versus internal um, and focusing more on the challenges from Moscow and Beijing to those that we face at home. Um, and that means that when we talk about challenges on uh, platforms, when we think about tech regulation, uh, we need to be, I think, enhancing our understanding, but our literacy of what these right-wing extremist groups pose on these platforms. And so we shouldn't just be talking about election intrusion from Moscow. We should be talking about this from, um, again, kind of, attempted insurrectionists, right-wing extremist groups. We need to inform, at least from an American perspective, um, Americans about what happens on Parler and what's happening on these platforms as the conversation shifts away from Facebook and Twitter to these other outlets. And uh, from the national security angle, and this is the final point I'll make, uh, when we look at the kind of tech agenda on the National Security Council, when we look at the democracy agenda on the National Security Council, we can no longer just be focused on these challenges from extremists outside our borders, from challenges from Moscow and Beijing. We need to be looking at these internal uh, domestic terrorist extremist groups as a national security challenge as well. And I think that that needs to happen at the top, at the national security level, but also be filtered through um, the American conscious as well, so that we have this broader understanding of what a, a domestic threat to our constitution looks like, because I think it's changing in real time and we're, we're slow on the uptake. Just a short note, if I may, we have 30 seconds remaining and then the other people from the breakout rooms will join us again. Yeah, thank you, Milena. Uh, I think we are uh, ending on a um, on a big task. Uh, so prioritizing uh, was um, maybe a good idea. Um, I think there's a lot um, to take in and um, thinking about how we can be resilient to such threats. I think is at the heart of yeah of um, our future um, as democratic. Uh, nations and also at the future of uh, transatlantic relations. Um, I'm already um, thinking that we will have a little comment or time for comments from the group um, in a second uh, because we want to make a little round of uh, results. Uh, so if any uh, of the group members from yesterday want to already think about it, uh, you can. Uh, and I'm welcoming back uh, all of the other breakout rooms and hope your discussions were as, yeah, as interesting uh, as ours and that there have been some um, interesting points made, uh, some new inputs to the groups and maybe uh, the other way around. I would give to Paulina now, uh, who wants to interview our groups a little bit um, on what they learned. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Corina. I hope everybody can hear me um, and hopefully also see me. Um, this was a very, uh, I would say, at least for my group, fascinating discussion of a very complicated topic. And I would like to, again, uh, touch upon or ask the presenters to try to summarize uh, their conversations uh, in just two or three sentences. First, I guess I should introduce myself to uh, members uh, of other groups. My name is Paulina Garayev. I'm the programs manager of the Israel Public Policy Institute. And it was my pleasure to accompany the group discussing digital sphere. Uh, but uh, I will start uh, actually with uh, the first group and Daniel, that would be you. I'm curious to hear uh, what did you come up with? How did your conversation advance from Tuesday? And what, uh, as uh, was mentioned in our guiding questions, what kind of milestones do we need to hit in order to realize those wonderful solutions that you mentioned before? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. So it's difficult to summarize, <laughs> again, summarize the entire conversation. And I think there was a lot of echoing of the things that were already mentioned uh, before the breakout rooms. For example, that we have to look beyond that uh, false dichotomy of external and internal um, threats coming from the outside or from internal forces, 
But I think um, maybe to go a bit more in detail, I think one thing that was quite interesting about, for example, public funding was that we said that it has to be more specialized and that, for example, in Germany or in Europe, oftentimes public funding for civil society is only project based and not really based on just the normal infrastructure or critical infrastructure that you need to function as an organization or that certain uh, cash flow procedures just make it very difficult for NGOs to survive. So I think um, this is probably the most detailed point of the discussion that I'd like to highlight here, um, which we may can take forward um, in, in our work as well. And of course, obviously, this probably holds true for the, for, for the United States as well. So I think that would be probably uh, summarizing it up in the most uh, detailed way, at least for one certain point. Thank you very much, Daniel. We're making this a bit of a quick fire round just so that we can move forward with the program. But first, I am very curious to hear also from the Transatlantic Security Group. That would be Yulia. Uh, any thoughts uh, that can be summarized in two or three sentences? This is quite a challenge, I would say. Yulia, are you with us? Well, till we regain we touch with uh, Yulia, I suggest that we yeah. jump forward to the EU Green Deal. And that would be Maria. Maria, can you hear us? Uh, no, okay, perfect. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion, and indeed, we, uh, it brought our our I think what we what we've achieved with our group uh, a bit forward because we talked about issues I didn't mention in our presentation. Um, first of all, we had um, a discussion about what what role the Paris Agreement can can play in the cooperation between the EU and the US, and um, it is obvious that the US. Um, should ideally join, should be joining the Paris Agreement because it is also a global framework to which uh, not just these two parties, but um, also states of the global south um, adhere. Um, but then also there is a lot of criticism regarding the Paris Agreement because um, the nationally determined goals of many countries are not ambitious enough and have been overachieved also. So it's also, of course, the question with what uh, NDCs the US will join the agreement. Uh, then we'll, we were talking about how um, uh, uh, the, both countries can uh, bring in the climate uh, aspect in the migration issue, uh, which is, of course, a, a major issue in, in the US and in the EU. Um, and in the US, there, there is still not, no, no such definition as the climate refugees. Um, we discussed it quite a lot, uh, and one of the uh, conclusions was uh, that maybe uh, the US could join um, the Global Compact on Migration or other international platforms that are there uh, to cooperate with the EU on this issue, which is um, getting more and more central. Um, and uh, last but not least, we talked quite a lot about um, the importance of um, ramping up the com communication efforts both within the EU and the US uh, on, on the green green agenda, green economy, green climate, um, and, and globally, and particularly uh, um, together with uh, ramping up the efforts to financially support the countries of the global south to bring forward the green ag agenda in these countries through financing some certain projects. So that's, I think, pretty much about it. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for this quick update. I see Yulia, um, at least I see your screen. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Sorry, um, I tried to unmute myself, but actually my taking action was a bit counterproductive. Um, so um, we spoke about uh, a broad uh, issue, a broad range of topics. Um, so it's very challenging um, to, to summarize it. Um, most importantly, um, we sp spoke about the issue of what does healing um, actually mean. And we found that this is basically an issue of restoring trust between um, the US and European allies, because if there's no trust, um, transatlantic relations are just not valuable. We then came to the question of what does um, Europe um, actually mean we didn't, kind of didn't really find a consensus here, I think, whether we're speaking of a broad definition or just a more limited definition. Um, we quickly touched upon the question of how um, NATO or European and, and um, 
Europe and the US should place themselves in terms of relations with China. And we highlighted that um, countering disinformation campaigns, cyber attacks, and protecting critical infrastructures um, are very important. Um, we quickly touched upon the issue whether uh, defense spending just means um, investing in military capabilities and clarify that this also means investing more in policing and state building. Um, we also spoke at the very end of the session about the very important issue of arms control. This is something we haven't um, previously covered on, on Tuesday and certainly here um, the US is in a position to provide more space for, for dialogue and, and cooperation. And I think Lena was it who perfectly summarized it. We were speaking about cooperation, strategizing, and about healing. That's a wonderful way to summarize this, I think. Um, and thank you very much for your input as well. We'll now move to the Sabina, which is a rep who is representative of the fourth and uh, the final group. Uh, would you mind sharing with us what we've discussed for the last uh, 20 minutes? Zabina? Okay, yeah, well, I needed to be able to unmute myself for that to start, so thank you. Um, so we didn't really have enough time to come up with like concrete, like as a group, what we would say are the milestones, but I think we had a, we had three um, inputs from, from members of our group, of our discussion that um, show the direction of where milestones could be for achieving um, better alignment or cooperation uh, between the EU and the US uh, on digital policy and then China. Um, I think for the EU or basically pointing out where what still has to be done, what's lacking. For the EU, um, it was pointed out that um, the EU has to really come to terms and define what its economic interests really are and how they align with its other uh, goals. Um, and um, the uh, comprehensive agreement on investment was mentioned in that regard, uh, the bilateral investment agreement that the two sides struck at the end of last minute at the end of last year uh, that would in some some critics fear um, integrate German companies for example much closer into China's digital economy um, then would be good from a digital rights national security perspective and this is something of course that the European Parliament will take up and that is still a matter of debate and it's also not yet um, concluded. Um, the US, on the other hand, um, has to recognize that it's been lagging behind on internet regulation and even the growing recognition that not everything, not every European regulation um, amounts to protectionism because it's actually protecting citizens' rights. Um, it will still be very hard internally to get these laws passed um, in, in Congress, for example. And um, so the US has a lot of homework to do there. Um, and lastly, um, for both sides, the recommendation has been, or one of the milestones would be for the EU and the US to cooperate more closely in multilateral forums and settings um, for standard setting that incorporates human rights considerations also when it comes to the rest of the world. So for example, surveillance technology exports and things like that. Um, I would leave it at that because that is a very long to-do list already, thanks. That is true. Thank you very much, Sabina, and thank you very much to all the presenters who uh, know, not only took part in such fascinating discussions, but also rose to the challenge of summarizing those in the three to five minutes. Uh, I'm sure that wasn't easy, but it gave us a lot of food for thought and a lot of uh, sub, uh, substance to now uh, discuss and review as we continue with our discussion. And with that being said, I'll give back the microphone to Giorgio. Uh, who will then take, take us on to the next part. Giorgio, please. Vielen Dank, Paulina. Ich habe immer die Zeitverzögerung, weil ich eben die deutsche Übersetzung höre. Ähm, aber wir kommen jetzt zusammen auf die Schlussgerade. Ich glaube, wir haben jetzt viele interessante Ideen und Impulse gekriegt, gehört äh, für einen neuen, für einen besseren Transatlantizismus. Und wir würden jetzt gerne eine abschließende Reflexionsrunde machen mit zwei Expertinnen, die wir eingeladen haben, die sich wie kaum jemand sonst eignet, mit uns äh, dieses Thema zu reflektieren. Wir haben 
heute Abend äh, jetzt oder heute Morgen in Amerika Dr. Tori Tausig ähm, und Dr. Sergej Lagodinsky. Und ich erkläre Ihnen, warum wir uns recht viel versprechen von einem Abschlussgespräch mit den beiden. Ich fange mal mit meinem ehemaligen Kollegen Sergej an. Ähm, Sergej ist wahrscheinlich der transatlantischste Grüne, den es gibt. Als ich vor dreieinhalb Jahren an der Böll Stiftung angefangen habe zu arbeiten, war Sergej mein Kollege und hatte gerade eine, ein, ein Manifest publiziert, das hieß ähm, Trotz alledem Amerika. Und das war gerade als Trump seine Präsidentschaft begann, als sehr viele ein ungutes Gefühl hatten, wie geht es weiter mit Amerika. Und Serge hat im grünen Milieu eine Transatlantikfahne hochgehalten und hat eben uns auch nahegelegt, dass er gesagt hat, Amerika ist mehr als Trump. Es gibt vieles, was uns verbindet an Themen, an Akteuren und ähm, sitzt heute im Europaparlament. Und ich glaube, ich freue mich sehr, dass äh, du dabei bist, Serge. Und du hast eine sehr schöne neue Brille, by the way. Danke, dass du hier bist. Ähm, und dann Tori Tausig die uns aus Vermont äh, zugeschaltet ist, ähm, ist eine amerikanische Analystin, Politikwissenschaftlerin, ähm, aber sie kennt auch Deutschland sehr gut. Sie war äh, Fellow der Bosch Stiftung und längere Zeit in Berlin und in dieser Zeit auch ähm, außenpolitische Beraterin, eine Zeit lang von unserem Bundestagsabgeordneten Cem Özdemir. Und äh, sie war auch öfter bei uns an der Böll Stiftung. Ich kann mich daran erinnern, äh, sie auch äh, schon gesehen zu haben. Und als ich sie eingeladen habe, habe ich gesagt, Tori, ich würde sagen, du gehörst zur erweiterten grüne Familie. Sie hat nicht widersprochen. Und deshalb äh, freuen wir uns sehr auf Tori Tausig und Sergej Lagodinski für unsere finale äh, Reflexionsrunde. Moderiert wird sie von unserem Vorstand Dr. Ellen Überschee. Also wir haben hier äh, einen Doktortitel nach dem anderen unser Vorstand und jetzt übergebe ich an Ellen äh, und Tori und Sergey. Äh, diese Abschlussdiskussion findet in Englisch statt, damit das alles gut läuft. Mit den Übersetzungen bitte ich alle drei Sprecher, den Sprachkanal auf Englisch zu setzen, damit ähm, äh, wir dann die Übersetzung haben. Bitte, Ellen. Ja. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we are short on time and we've heard such a lot of fascinating results from our young uh, transatlanticists and uh, we thank them and uh, perhaps we uh, do some uh, deep dives into the four topics so that you can uh, give a kind of uh, kind of responding. Um, Tori, the era Trump has shown as Europeans in many ways, that we have to assume more responsibility in shaping our foreign and security relations. And given the pivot of the US to Asia, um, to which degree you would say that Europeans are also expected to do more in Asia alongside with the US and Asian democracy? What can the EU deliver? Or do you think they should not interfere in, uh, in Asia, but uh, care for, uh, for their surroundings? Tori, please unmute yourself. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Ellen, it's very nice to see you, uh, and Sergey, wonderful to see you as well. Uh, just a brief note, I will always be indebted to Sergey because uh, a few years ago now, actually, Sergey came to speak to a group of Bosch fellows that I was a part of uh, in Berlin, and it was at the height of his election campaign, and he was running all over the place in Germany, and he somehow made time to, to get on a train and come to Berlin and speak to this group of Americans um, in Germany. So, Sergey, thank you again, and it's very nice, nice to see you. Um, Ellen, you've, you've posed a very interesting question about what the new Biden administration expects of Europeans. Uh, during a time when we are likely to see the United States continue to focus on China as the preeminent foreign policy challenge in the years ahead. I think this, at least in theory, is a continuation that we will see from the Trump administration to the Biden administration is this focus on China. Um, there will be very different tactics uh, carried out by this new administration in taking on challenges from China and in working with our allies, especially European allies, uh, but China will remain a preeminent focus. 
Uh, you asked whether the United States would expect uh, Europeans to do more in Asia. Uh, it's an interesting question. However, I think if we were to look at the priorities this administration will come in having for its European partners, it would not be to see uh, more Germans, more French uh, carrying out for freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. That's important. It will probably continue to be an ask, but I think the nature of the challenge that China poses has shifted in the United States from looking just at Chinese infringements of international law, uh, international waters in the South China Sea, to much more of a challenge here at home, within our own uh, democratic societies uh, mm -hmm. in the United States and in Europe. And to that extent, I think we are going to see this administration ask more of Europeans um, to, to take action here at home, uh, particularly in the digital space. This came up uh, several times in our discussion, whether or not Europeans will ban Huawei from 5G networks. Uh, I think that Europeans should. Um, I think defending our digital sovereignty against a digital authoritarian mm -hmm. model will be critical going forward. Uh, it's, a, it's an important debate that we will have over the next few years. I think another uh, ask we will see from the Americans to the Europeans is to um, focus more on the political influence that comes with China's economic leverage in our societies. And thirdly, I think we will see increased calls for cooperation and um, comments on Chinese human rights abuses, uh, whether that be against the Uyghur community within China, against the democracy movement in Hong Kong, um, but also when China infringes on our democratic values closer to home. Uh, so Thank you. Yeah, Tori, let's bring in Sege. Uh, Sege, in response to that, what do you think could, uh, uh, under the new administration, transatlantic solidarity mean in, in, in the context of these uh, security cooperation fields that Tori mentioned? unmute myself. Oh, it's great to be here. Um, I think, I think to be honest, um, it's, it is about taking more responsibility and it is about taking responsibility seriously. And um, what I wanted to mention is that because we're talking about progressive agenda, right? Uh, I think that uh, the should start thinking about what does it mean for progressives to be responsible and to take responsibility seriously because this is the question that is under um, undervalued very much um, and I think it means that we have to start thinking in alternatives uh, not just uh, saying what we don't want but what we want instead and how it's going to work I think uh, taking uh, progressive responsibility seriously means uh, thinking in owning the problems instead of discussing about them and criticizing them. And uh, that means also not just uh, uh, to have demands, but also um, to try to solve them. And starting from there, we would need to think about what it means to have a, a, a responsible progressive response to uh, the new administration. And I think it would mean that we would need to take more care of our security uh, ourselves, and we should start a stop um, having this um, antagonizing and th this kind of false dichotomy and false contradiction between progressiveness and security policy. And if we don't do that, then the problem are gonna um, uh, haunt us. We should solve problems and not hide away from problems. And that means also speaking openly about uh, issues that we probably didn't want to touch before um, and taking responsibility more seriously. I don't think we should engage in Asia militarily, but I do think that we should engage in, in Asia in terms of, for example, looking at human rights situation, for example, calculating whether we want investment agreements like we had before and whether it hurts our common interests, whether transatlantic or universal. Mm -hmm. 
Um, let's uh, perhaps uh, go a bit further to, um, uh, we won't manage, I think, due to uh, time restrictions uh, to, to, to come to all uh, points. But uh, the next, and it was already mentioned, uh, important point is digital policies towards China, but its trends in, in, in transatlantic terms is also, uh, it's also very important. important. Um, uh, perhaps we, we switch now and say Gay is the first um, uh, to answer. We see uh, that uh, China is very assertive in, in the digital space and we see the uh, Europe going big steps towards uh, regulation of, uh, of, of um, the digital uh, sphere. What would you say, you, where are, we, we, we saw a notion of low-hanging fruits. Are there any low-hanging fruits in cooperation in the digital sphere in terms of regulation or cooperation? Or uh, do you think this is uh, a, um, an issue that, that has to be uh, discussed for, for a long time? And uh, we know that uh, the commission has proposed a new council to establish a new council and so on. And then perhaps we switch to Tori to, on the digital to point. I, I, I think to be honest that it's gonna be a very tough, uh, uh, tough path because I, but to be honest, don't see quite how we will converge in terms of our important regulatory questions with Americans. Um, and, and this is going to be a long road. And especially I see in two areas. First of all, uh, generally, the regulative culture is different. Um, and number two, I see in this particular uh, field, the data uh, uh, the relationship with data protection is different. Um, I think that it, we will not be able to advance if we're talking about um, uh, progressive digital common agenda, right? I mean, we can, of course, now start transmitting trans data the way we want, but we want a progressive one. And, uh, um, and, and there, I think, uh, on that point, probably the first move and the first uh, responsibility is on the Biden administration to start talking about a national data protection standard uh, that would, for example, ensure uh, a possibility for us to share data to begin with. And I don't need to remind those who know the uh, European Court of Justice uh, uh, decision on, uh, on, on the privacy shield, et cetera, et cetera. We are not able uh, to trust each other um, because, you know, of course, we're not able to trust each other starting with NSA to begin with. But if there is an effort on the side of Washington to try to at least somehow show that the data protection is, is taken seriously, that the cloud regulation uh, is taken seriously, and, and that uh, anti-monopoly and, and competition law is taken seriously in terms of, and I'm sorry to say, we will have to do this. I, I know that some people are here from Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's not possible to work uh, under the, such a predominance of two or three companies who especially also work cross-sectorally like Amazon, who basically owns not just one thing, but also the clouds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There, I think the competition regulation has to start in, in Washington. Tori, what do you think about the digital sphere? I completely agree with Sergey. Europe has been a leader in this space and the United States is lagging behind, particularly on data protection, and especially if we're talking about a progressive agenda moving forward. I would add one proactive step I think Europeans and Americans can take together, and that is on uh, joint R&D and innovation efforts to ensure that Europe has viable alternatives to both American and Chinese uh, providers such as Huawei. So I think we can do more on the innovative R&D side together. Um, but I agree with Sergey. I think the United States is lagging behind. And as we saw, Europeans in the past with GDPR set a global standard. Uh, I think we're going to see Europeans be a first mover on the regulatory front moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, just to switch to the point of democracy, which uh, was also in our polling and in the beginning, uh, the most important um, topic. And uh, I, laugh, I like the, the, the notion that uh, democracy is kind of participatory uh, sports. 
Um, Tori, what, how, how should it look like and what can we bring forward together to make our democracies resilient and to bring them forward? What, how, does it, how does this look, uh, participant sports? Well, it's clear that in the last few years, at least in the United States, we have taken our democracy for granted. Uh, I, I don't think we can be clearer about that. And despite it being a new day in America, as President Biden said, we are still going to be facing very strong forces of nativism, nationalism, white supremacy, and the extreme right that continue to fester in our society, in our societies in both the US and Europe. Um, so I think it's absolutely right. Democracy needs to be more of a particip participatory sport. And one thing we talked about that I couldn't agree more with is, is funding for civil society organizations and making politics local. Um, you, you know, the way we all get our news these days, we trust and we agree with news that we know, people that we know, our local communities. Therefore, we need to bring politics back home. We need to ensure that people are engaged in their local civil society organizations so that we don't think democracy is just the job of, of somebody else in our country. I think the stakes mm -hmm. are too high and we've taken our democracy for granted over the last few years. Absolutely. I think, Sege, you can join in on that point very, uh, very good. Yes, I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's important. And we see, of course, for me, what we've seen in the past couple of weeks is actually proof um, uh, quite uh, counterintuitively to many people that American democracy uh, is um, is resilient. Um, I, I uh, usually tell my friends uh, here, um, what would have happened if we had a president like that with, uh, with that style somewhere in Hungary or in Poland, um, uh, where the courts are already have been domestic, domesticated and, and, and basically how do, how do you call it? You know, they, they do what, what the, there, there is basically no division of power. Um, in the United States, the courts, the media and the, and the Congress uh, actually were those who saved democracy. Uh, um, and if we hadn't we have them, then, then, then it wouldn't have worked. But I'm a little bit concerned, and I, I, I hope I may uh, to speak about the other side and not so much about my side, uh, about some tendencies, which I think, talking about the progressive agenda um, and kind of a libertarian progressive agenda, could point into a wrong direction. I, am, I, I, I belong to those who are a little bit concerned over the ban um, uh, policies of large uh, platforms. Um, I, I think we should talk, as I mentioned before, about the platforms themselves and their algorithms and their uh, um, ad advertisement policies uh, and their monetiz monetizing policies, et cetera, et cetera, rather than uh, applauding them and, and kind of allowing them and saying, you know, you, now you can ban whoever you want. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned about that because this is not a kind of American way of dealing with free uh, discourse. I understand this was a different kind of a situation, but I hope it doesn't proliferate. Um, number two, um, I, I am also a little bit um, uh, cautious and I know that many civil society organizations already have told um, and have uh, uh, voiced their concerns about kind of the push to that resilience towards, uh, you know, no flight, uh, lists uh, to um, terrorists, domestic terrorist suspects, etc. Tori, if I may, something where I am a little bit concerned about also that framing that there is no difference between foreign and and domestic uh, enemies, um, because I am I am a little bit concerned that this could bring us into a way where we employ in our domestic uh, um, uh, realm. Um, instruments that are actually tailored for foreign uh, re resilience against foreign threat. So as you know, this is kind of a discussion as always, for example, using the military force in Germany or, or also in the United States, as we have seen uh, in domestic circumstances, which should be an exception. If we don't have this division, if we don't have this border between domestic criminals and maybe terrorists and, uh, and foreign agents, we would have a problem. 
Um, so, and I didn't even start speaking about democracy challenging in the Euro European Union because we have so many <laughs> that, that if we start talking to, about them, we will never end. But it would be interesting, just, just to finish on that note, if we will be talking about democracy uh, uh, caucus or, or, or alliance of democracies, conference of democracies that Biden summit maybe or summit, will uh, call in, uh, it would be yeah. to see how many of us, which countries, uh, will be invited from the European side and my proposal would be to disinvite Hungary, but to invite Poland uh, and see what, what happens then. Um, <laughs> also to show kind of the incentive or where you should go and shouldn't develop um, uh, in yeah. order to, to keep being invited. Okay, uh, we've run out of time, uh, unfortunately, and I think we all agree upon the idea that we have really to double down on uh, f uh, um, fighting for our democracies now where a uh, kind of window of opportunity has opened and we really should use it. And we as Heinrich Böll Foundation, of course, we will use it definitely. And I would like to thank Tori and Sergei for this very short but very intense talk. Uh, talk uh, that we will continue from uh, at another place in time. And uh, so I hand back to Giorgio. Giorgio, please unmute yourself. <lacht> Vielen Dank, Ellen. Und wir sind damit zum Ende unserer Veranstaltung gekommen. Sie sehen, ich bin auch schon ein bisschen müde. Um, ich hoffe, Sie sind haben noch ein bisschen Energie und können vielleicht auf den Reaktionen-Button gehen und einen kleinen virtuellen Applaus allen unseren Panelisten geben, allen unseren uh, Next Generation Transatlanticists, unseren fantastischen Facilitators Corinna Fischer, David Patrician, Paulina Gereif und uh, Lena Strauss um, und allen, die uns geholfen haben, diese uh, Veranstaltung zu machen. Das war heute die zweite öffentliche Veranstaltung im Rahmen unserer 21. außenpolitischen Jahrestagung. Wir sind noch nicht fertig. Wir haben noch äh, eine Veranstaltung am nächsten Donnerstag um dieselbe Uhrzeit äh, und werden da unter anderem mit Annalena Baerbock, Florenz Gaub und Nathalie Tocci noch einmal die Frage Europa in der Welt, äh, sagen wir mal, im grünen Kontext reflektieren. Wir würden uns freuen, wenn Sie wieder zahlreich dabei sind. Die Veranstaltung wird wiederum zweisprachig sein. Und äh, alle weiteren Details finden Sie bei uns auf der Webseite. Letzte Bitte, bevor wir Sie in den Abend oder in den amerikanischen Vormittag entlassen. Wir haben wieder eine kleine ähm, Evaluation. Das sind sehr wenige Fragen. Und Sie werden im Chat jetzt wahrscheinlich die, den, ähm, den Link kriegen. Und wir würden uns freuen, wenn Sie diesen Evaluationsbogen ausfüllen und uns sagen, wie es Ihnen gefallen hat, damit wir eventuell noch Dinge on the fly verbessern können. Wie gesagt, nächste Woche geht es noch mal weiter, anderthalb Stunden mit äh, grüner Außen- und Sicherheitspolitik und Annalena Baerbock. Das war's von meiner Seite. Ich danke Ihnen noch mal, wünsche Ihnen einen schönen Abend. Good morning, America. Und ähm, bis nächste Woche. Auf Wiedersehen.